Welcome to the Subbed Podcast. Subbed is a female founded company that drives empowerment and education for the equality of young females and women. We deliver this through a vehicle of sport jam packed with the journeys of strong, successful, and unapologetically talented sportswomen. My name is Kirby. I'm a former Australian rugby sevens player, an Australian 15s Wallaroo, and I was even on the water in my time as an Australian dragon boat paddler. I'm the founder of Subbed, and I'm here to elevate conversations, unearth the truthful stories, and add value into developing a female psyche that initiates opportunity with confidence, tracks adversity with resilience, and thrives relentlessly without prejudice. If you want to hear more, sub yourself in. I'm Katie Duncan and I, uh, I was born in a um, little small town, Cambridge, just outside of Hamilton and I grew up uh, in Hamilton in the Waikato um, and uh, I have an older brother who's about just over a year um, older than me and so I think when you have an older brother who is quite sporty uh, themselves, they, they naturally get their little sister um, into sports. Um, and uh, it kind of means that you've always got a little friend to, to play with. So um, I always wanted to, I always looked up to Charlie and, um, you know, I wanted to, to be like him and, and I guess I, I saw him playing football um, and I wanted to play football too. Um, so that's, I guess, uh, how I, probably why I got um, into into sports. Um, there's, there's, I know there's a few other reasons. My parents um, grew up in, uh, in a religion um, called Brethren's and uh, they actually w- weren't able to play sports with other people. Um, and um, both my parents were quite naturally sporty um, and they, they could play sports at home. Um, but so when they uh, left left the um, Brethren Church. Um, I was pretty young. I was I think I was only one. Charlie would have been two, and um, so they they kind of knew like sports was something that they enjoyed. So they wanted to give their kids the I guess the opportunities maybe that they didn't perhaps have. So um, yeah, sports just kind of came natural to me, and I have loved it and continue to love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Can you, um, just to give a bit of a scope on the level that, well, you, I know you're not playing now, but um, just for people listening, can you give um, a background on the level of sport and what sport you were in and, and sort of your highest highs or your highlights into your sporting career? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I grew up playing heaps of different sports. I played... Um, um, football, volleyball, cricket, touch with you, yeah, Kirby. Um, <laughs> that was terrible. And, at touch. Um, um, all sorts of different sports, and um, actually, um, I think when I was around fourteen or fifteen, and my parents were like, "Okay, Katie, like you need to decide probably on one because we can't like continue to take you around to 20 different um, yeah. sporting events and, and training and things so um, I think I chose football I was probably uh, like um, I, I played each sport kind of well but football was probably better like best at so I just kind of naturally cho- chose that um, and um, that kind of took me onto the path of um, you kind of, you got onto like the um, Waikato reps and then that slowly went to um, like a, a invitational national camp when I was I think like under 16s and then from there I just progressed um, through um, under 20 World Cup back in 2006 um, Russia and Russia that was kind of I guess that my first pinnacle event um, after high school, because high, um, I moved straight up to Auckland, um, so uh, I can I could be a more of a full time footballer. Um, so it was pretty challenging to move away from the family. At, was that I a, guess, um, age, but. was that a was that a um, 
like a contracted opportunity or was that just something you did off the bat and no, on a what no, yeah there's no, there's no money and, and especially in youth uh, te- New Zealand teams there's, there's definitely not money um, <laughs> there but um, do they provide well, support um, like say by way of accommodation or that kind of thing transport to help you as, like to cater for your commitment to playing no. no. Back okay. then, that was a little while ago, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, nothing like that, but um, I stayed with like family friends and I was working in a cafe um, and, and then going to, to trainings. Um, but we, yeah, I guess when you're young and, you know, like you're in the New Zealand team and your coach has like a vision and you just, you just, um, you kind of, you just get on with it and um, kind of, and you just in the, you love, you love it, loving it, and and then you like get to go overseas and Russia and everything. That's all free, so World Cups are totally free. So I would say that I haven't been paid um, heaps for for football, but. You know what I have had in terms of the places I've travelled for free, basically. Mm. The the people I've met, the um, uh, you know, playing professionally overseas. I guess that's where some, the money comes in a bit more, um, and just the experience of you know playing for your country. And so there's so many like, um, you know, the whole money thing is always going to be. Uh, a struggle and something that is improving so I'm glad that's that is improving um, but uh, you know that they'll never replace or um, over trump the experiences and, and um, positive like things that have come from you know playing for New Zealand and traveling the world basically yeah that's true that's great um, as a, a female in sport what makes you successful or what made you successful for so how many years did you play at that elite level? Um, so, yeah, so I mentioned I, st- uh, I guess... Um, Straight out of school. So, uh, that, like Waikato and then that, go, that went to New Zealand and yeah. then that went to um, under-20s and then that went to women's. Yeah. Um, and then I played for over over 10 years for the football firms and wow. um, I think a lot of my success came well I think it's a combination of things one I think you have to have some sort of I guess ability or talent um, but I was never like the best in the team or like the star of the team it was never me but I um, I guess my characteristics like I was normally like one of the fittest um, and um, I always worked really hard um, in all trainings uh, in, in games, it didn't really matter what environment it was, I just always went, uh, gave, I guess I always gave it my best and um, I have the personality of always wanting to improve and so um, with those kind of combinations uh, just led me to playing um, longer and longer and after I got to, in the end I got to go to four World Cups and three Olympics and it was the second World Cup um, in Germany and afterwards um, uh, Winton Rupert who had a friend in Germany called me up and he said do you want to go play in in Germany in the women's Bundesliga and I was like a bit shocked really because I never actually backed myself to play professional football. Yeah okay. Uh, even Why I was that? my country, I was like, oh, well, like, they will be way better than me. Like, how could, like, someone from New Zealand, like, go play overseas and, yeah. like, professionally? And I basically had a week to decide and, um, and then I left and I went there and, um, and it was, yeah, I guess that was just the start of my professional, um, football journey, um, which has had its challenges and pros and cons, but um, and then I actually retired after the 
2016 Olympics. Um, I wanted to finish my uni and um, do some teaching. Okay. And then um, I guess I got itchy feet and slash I was like real real life is hard. <laughs> <laughs> like freaking, you know, get out every day and like, yeah. on reflection, as hard as the athlete life is in terms of the sacrifices you have to give in terms of, um, you know, I'm missing so many friends, birthdays, yeah. weddings and all that uh, side of stuff. Yeah. Um, I just felt that, you know, it, it, it is a, I guess it was like what I had done for so long and, and what I had known and so I thought oh, I'll make a um, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best to get in and make the uh, World Cup squad and if I get in I get in if I don't um, that's 2019 World Cup if I don't then I, I won't have any regrets like I will know well, well I gave it a, ch- a shot and um, I didn't make it or I did so um, I did get into um, the, that World Cup squad, but um, we didn't progress or anything, unfortunately, in, through the rounds. Um, and, you know, when you look back, you're like, oh, I could have been fitter, or I could have done this and that, but um, that's okay. So, um, nice yeah, I had around in terms too. over 120-odd games for, wow. for the Ferns in the end, um, one of the... Um, highest captain, and, and it was um, yeah. That's an incredible. Experience. Yeah, that's an amazing career in soccer. Next question is around the the challenges faced as as a young person, and there was this um, this article that came out last year, which I read through, and the content of it around you and like your experiences as a, as a young in um, were quite horrific to read, and then in contrast to see how well you've come out the other side um, and that was around um, the loss of your mum through domestic violence and um, sexual abuse that occurred as a, as a young girl as well. Can you speak into that for us around just briefly what occurred and also as a young female how did you combat that um, and I know in the article you mentioned that it was suppressed for like 20 odd years um, before you've come out to speak about it. But can you can you sort of jot us through how that was for you as a young and and going through that? Um, uh, uh, so um, yeah, I guess I had a few challenge, challenges as a young, youngster um, with. Uh, starting with my mum dying when I was around um, eight, and um, that was—I mean—that was pretty uh, traumatizing in itself um, because uh, because of how um, her life was taken uh, by a jealous ex ex boyfriend uh, for me and my brother to find um, after school. So I guess. Um, you know, not not a typical um, childhood uh, upbringing with that sort of thing happening, and um, and then um, a couple of years later, um, I was um, sexually abused by a babysitter who was who was meant to be looking after us for for just for the evening, I think, um, and the. Mum dying was a little bit different because, you know, it was known and um, so I guess the support was there. But when um, I was sexually abused, that was kind of a, something that I kept to myself um, for, a, for a number of reasons. Um, the main thing being um, that it was a one-off and that I thought that it wasn't that bad um, and so I was just blew it off um, and uh, it was kind of, in a way, um, easier not to address. But um, I'm really glad that I did um, find the courage to come forward about that um, because 
it was it ended up being like a huge weight off my, my shoulders but yeah. um and within the whole process it actually led me to getting um some help professional help and uh and to actually dig deeper into even going back to what what kind of happened to my mum because i never really addressed that yeah um and it's funny because i yes i see them those things being challenges mm-hmm. um in my life but as as sad as they um i think i know that they kind of shaped me to the person that i am today and um like i don't wish either of them on anyone but it actually kind of they it does build that resilience i guess and um you know now i i'm someone that's always made the most out of life because my mum was only 29 when she died so i'm kind of like um you know you gotta you gotta live your life otherwise you, you know, well you just don't know when, when it's gonna go so you know why not if you get the option to uh be happy and um live a fulfilled life then then why not take that yeah that's so true i'm sorry you had to go through all of that um was sport a positive outlet for any of that or did that just go part and parcel with something you were naturally talented at anyway yeah i mean looking back now like you tend to do this when you i guess get a bit older you look back and you're like wow actually sport um in a way saved me from my own uh troubles um you know in terms of it kept me busy yep. um, for one um i was always playing sports after school every day um and um so it kept me kind of busy and occupied but also i know that it was a way probably for my a little bit like of, i guess anger like to be released like through sports and um but also like pushing myself and pushing the boundaries and and working hard um and like i said like i look back now at my characteristics as a player and it is a lot to do with um the characteristics that i built through my mum passing away yeah. and the uh, sexual abuse so it's kind of a weird um realization I guess but then it's like well that kind of makes you who you are so you can either embrace it or like you know um, yeah. or it can be be a negative but I, I see it see them as positives that's great um so what are you I guess you've already touched on this um in terms of resilience but what are your strengths today as a woman um through sport and through life and all that you've encountered yeah. and experienced, what would your strengths be? I think my strengths um, today uh, would be um, really prioritising my well-being and mental health. Um, I took for granted playing sports professionally and it wasn't until I actually retired, stopped, um, and where I fell into a bit of a depression um, of, but I was first year teaching, but also I wasn't, I was too busy to exercise um, and kind of take care of myself uh, because of the workload. And so it's it's all a like vicious cycle, I guess. Like you feel like you're unhappy and you feel crap so you eat crap and you don't and you don't exercise and you just feel like shit and it's hard to get out of um but it's only like it's 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 only you that can kind of do something about it um and so i i i remember actually the time actually um, my wife priscilla was um away for work and i decided to set my alarm just for 20 minutes earlier every morning um but because I was like snoozing <laughs> for like half an hour because I just didn't want to get up I didn't want to go to work and um 
I and I've never like smoothed in my life. I'm really like jump out of bed, so I was a bit like uh, that was weird in itself. But I just set my alarm for 22 minutes early, um, then my and then and then like got out of bed, made myself get out of bed, do some exercise, and then that like actually I guess transformed um, my life in a way because that like propelled my health. Um, just shift your mindset or to yeah, break that yeah, sort and, of cycle. Um, and then also I started seeing someone kind of at the same time for um, seeing a professional, like a therapist to, to deal with some things as well. So it all kind of just started to become positive again. And, um, and I didn't really... Yeah, I didn't realise at the time, like, even that, you know, that setting my alarm that little bit earlier, like, how much that small moment can actually, like, help you in the long run. And then now, because I went through that, like, rough patch, um, I have, you know, I've said to, I say to myself and I've said to Silla, like, I'm, no matter how busy I get or we get, like, I will always prioritize my health and that and I know that through exercise and moving my body because um, but everyone's different you know that might be um, it might be I don't know like singing for someone else or I don't know but yeah um, I know for my body that when I exercise um, it, you know we, we know the science behind what exercise does to your body but for me like it's just a it's a whole like mental health thing and it makes you feel good and uh, so, yeah, I'll, I love it. And um, um, so I guess, um, yeah, so just prioritizing myself um, is a big, big thing. And another strength would be, like, not being afraid to get help um, or say, like, you know, say I'm not okay or, like, I need to just be, like, checking in with, with just with myself a bit better than maybe I have in the past. I just kind of like um, wrote, you know, just got on with things in yeah. the past. But now I try and. Which is funny because you said that earlier about um, when you were younger and you just sort of as hard as it was to travel um, with no pay and all, all that, moving up to Auckland and you just get on with it. <laughs> and now, as we're older, you realise actually sometimes you can't just get on with it and you need a hand up from someone or a, a, a larger support network so full circle yeah totally yeah totally and i i know that i i wouldn't have had such a long career if it wasn't for um Scylla, who i met when i was 19 okay. um because um you know she was able i guess um, she also played for the football first, but she retired um, in 2008. So, and then kind of got on the on the career bandwagon. But um, I guess um, supported me in a way because most people um, actually lived with their parents up in Auckland, so it was quite hard um, to be like not not you know not have my parents here and um, and, and financially like depend on them. I guess, um, but. Um, so that definitely helped um, in the support, but also she she knew um, being an athlete herself. She knew kind of what I had to do, and I kind of I, I know I prioritised. Um, uh, you know, athlete or football was number one for so many years, um, and she, but she understood that because she knew what it takes to um, to kind of I guess be at the top of your sport and in a way you know sports can be quite a selfish selfish um game um um, because of what you have to do to to maintain and um stay at that top level but if you've got a good support crew with you it just makes things a lot easier yeah that's so true she understands the environment of what's required because it's not normal like um (laughs) you know (laughs) with the mere mortals out there um Okay, our next question um, is something I've just started to introduce because there's, there's been some real common themes um, around the gender bias for women in sport. And so I was um, checking out this 
it was an interview that he had with One News um, and the discussion was around you coaching so how you've moved into coaching now and focus on the, the youth and um, you made a comment about um, needing to keep it fun and you'd said because the women don't get paid millions like like the men do um, so it was important that keeping the girls um, engaged um, for the longevity of their involvement in the sport anyway I, I know that the interview wasn't um, around the agenda of pay parities or the gender pay gap but it was interesting for you to make a comment like that which is quite bold and it's quite an obvious um, statement and issue for all women in sport that they're not paid um, or they're not paid equal or wherever they are in their current code so I just wanted to ask in soccer or football as a female what's a key observation that you've either or either observed or experienced for gender equality or inequality in your sport um yeah, it's always a bit of a tricky one, I guess. Um, the sad thing is, I think, like, it can also depend on in what sport that you're in, too. Um, like, for example, I know, um, like, the men's, New Zealand men's volleyball team, well, this is maybe a few years ago now, but they had to actually fund their whole, like, campaign and everything that they did. Um, and then, you know, like, so, and then we still got to go overseas and play in World Cups and stuff for free. So it kind of, I guess it depends how you look at it. Um, but what I, um, what, what I get most frustrated about is that um, even, say, at the club level in New Zealand, the club level is, like, not the greatest um, and not many teams get paid as such, but men footballers do um, and play at club level and um, for me it's like well the girls are doing the same amount of trainings or you know same commitment and so why is it different and do you know what I mean so um, is it case by case dependent on the club um, or uh, is it across the board that yeah can be dependent on the club, but it okay. comes down to like um, sponsorship at the end of the day and um, what, um, you know, sponsors see as, um, I guess, valuable or what's going to get them the uh, attention they need. And yes, I understand that um, uh, the might be more uh, spectators at a male football game, but if the same um, resource was put into the women's game, then perhaps in 10 years' time the um, league or the players will be as strong or, you know, and, and the football um, just as good, if, if you know what I mean. But it's if they receive the same exposure. Get play, like, so, you know, someone like me, I where I could potentially play club football, um, I mean, my body's pretty good room, but, um, you know, and just for completely free in a way, it's kind of, kind of like, well, I would rather coach and get paid for it yeah. um, than to still play and, and uh, put my um, knees under too much pressure. So, um, but, you know, uh, so that kind of, in a way, like that puts, puts you off, but if there was still a little bit of money in the game, um, it, it perhaps like that would just give me that little bit more incentive or like, okay, like, in that like way, like, like that might be worth it now, but I guess um, you can't forget that, well, in my opinion, the reason that women's football is so popular is because it is a game, it is a sport that doesn't, uh, that, that you don't get paid um, millions for and it's quite pure. Um, you know, you don't see as many like Hollywoods or like people diving and, um, you know, um, making, you know, drama on the field. Um, like often you see like a massive like tackle in football, female football, and they'll just like get back straight up again. And you're just like, you know, if that was a, 
if that was me now, would be like, they'll be milking the cow so that they get a cow, that, that type of thing. So, oh, well, okay. in some cases, that's yes. the, that is, um, um, generalizing there, but, but just that it's, um, you know, females play it because they like the love of the game. And then if you end up being really good and get to play for your country or get to play professionally and get to, pay, get to be paid um, from it, then... Um, that is just, and to me, that's just a bonus. Yeah. But I know that we need to like continue to inspire and like, um, um, you know, challenge organisations to for it to be fair. Um, but it does. I do believe it starts from the top too. You know, like they're slowly introducing um, rules around like board on boards. You've got to have a certain percentage of um, females to male ratio, and it will kind of trickle down and, and make sense um, in a way, you know, there's reasons why, yeah, yeah, we yeah. spend an hour just on Yeah, I know, that's a whole <laughs> other podcast, isn't it? Um, yeah, no, thanks for that. It's just, um, it's been an interesting theme in it, and there's been a, a sort of a common um, observation from everyone that we speak to about there's some kind of inequality in what we're doing and it's interesting that everyone sort of says you know xyz um, is a real issue but we're just going to do it anyway because we love it so it's just yeah yeah interesting to hear that again um okay wrapping up um final two questions what is um the best advice you would give your 15 year old self Hmm. Um, I reckon just that like it's okay to be different or like a bit weird, a bit, a bit unique, a bit quirky um, and just like just embrace, yeah embrace your uniqueness like uh, I think when you're a teenager you just want to like um, fit into the crowd or um, you know you want to be popular or the cool kids or whatever but just to be more um just to know that like yeah I guess um it's okay to be, be a bit different but also um that um yeah uh, keep keep continuing doing continue with sports definitely for sure um but I would have loved to, uh, in a way, I would have loved to be in a position at that age to get um, professional help then. Okay. But at the same time, I think um, I, I think you're you're ready to get help when you're ready. And, and I was thirty, and for some people, um, it's younger. For some people, it's not till they're older. So um, I guess in a way that you're you're only ready when you're truly ready to face yeah. it. And that's great. Um, and our final question: uh, What would your hopes for young females in sport and in the community be? Um, oh, just to continue um, to be in just continue to be involved in sports and um, to just give it your best because it just can teach you so many um, less life lessons on a personal level um, but also in team if you're in team environments and then I, I think when you get older it becomes more community focused and so just to continue to um, to be immersed in sports for as long as possible. Perfect.